Hello, my principled art sluts. It's Allison Moon, and you're listening to an episode of the Artgasm podcast. This podcast is all about the intersections of art and sexuality, and I'm so delighted you're joining me today. On this episode, I interview Kevin Patterson and Alana Phelan, two writers who have been working together on a series of books that are all about a multiracial, polyamorous group of superheroes working to dismantle systemic oppression. And I'm so delighted to be able to share this with you. If you are a longtime listener of the podcast, you will recognize Kevin Patterson from an earlier podcast where we discussed his book, Love's Not Colorblind. We have a wonderful far-flung conversation, including everything from indie publishing insider baseball to polyamorous stories gone wrong to bridge the gap as a nonfiction sex educator and a fiction writer, uh, along with a lot of other cool things. So I'm super excited to share this with you. Before we get to that, though, just one little bit of news. I think it's really important to state as a white person that Black Lives Matter. And I think it's also really important to say that there are a lot of amazing works of art that can help you if you are a non-Black person grappling with understanding how to see the world through the lens of systemic oppression and and through police violence, there are a lot of great works of art that can help you do that. Now, I'm sure if you've been on the internet at all over the past couple of weeks, you have seen a lot of people listing books to read and uh, and analysis to read and different people to follow. And I think those are all worthy and necessary things. I think that we should also understand, though, that fiction can be one of the more powerful tools to understand the world. And there's a lot of arguments around um, how and if... N- reading books, reading fiction, watching film does actually make for more empathetic people. And I think that that's a really worthy examination. I am currently on the position of, I think that empathy is just one part of the the lessons that we need to learn to be compassionate human beings in the world. I think it's kind of the first step. But there are many steps that follow empathy, which happen to do with action. But I think if you are at the place now where you're still trying to understand how this stuff is working uh, and how the system is set up in a inequitable way that disproportionately affects and harms people of color, then I think that there are a couple of different things that I would recommend you see. Um, There have been a couple of great films that I think are not only beautiful and entertaining, sometimes funny, thoughtful and just brilliantly done. And a couple of those films I just want to recommend to you. I think all of them are available on various streaming sites. You can rent some of them, but you can also, if you have Amazon, if you have Hulu, if you have Netflix, you can get them um, for free. I mean, for free, as in they are on your subscription. So um, the one that's been going around a lot is If Beale Street Could Talk, which is a, it's based on a James Baldwin novel. And it very directly, even though it is a historical film, it very directly explains explores and in some ways explains systemic oppression and police violence against black people. And it is a very sad story, but it's a very sweet story. It is, again, brilliantly shot, brilliantly acted. It's a beautiful film, all said, and I strongly recommend that you check it out. It's directed by Barry Jenkins, who you might remember from Moonlight, and it is in very much the same vein as Moonlight, beautiful. Uh, And if you're a costume nerd, if you're a music nerd, the period details are stunning and, again, all-around phenomenal film. Another film that didn't get nearly as much acclaim that I really, it it bothers me because I think it was a fantastic movie, was Blind Spotting. Blind Spotting takes place in Oakland and features David Diggs, who is fantastic in this film. And again, it's it's a film that explains how difficult it is when you have been incarcerated to get out from under the boot of the American judicial system. And even though David Diggs' character is doing everything he can to stay on the straight and narrow, he has a best friend who just does not experience the same consequences. He has a very different risk tolerance because he is white. And even though he grew up in Oakland and really identifies with black people and black community, because he is white, he does not appreciate the same risk that David Diggs' character does. And it's really, I think of, out of all the movies I've seen recently, uh, it's one of the best kind of slice of life stories about Oakland. I lived in Oakland for eight years and it, it was always delightful to see, you know, places I used to go and streets that I, I'm very familiar with and neighborhoods that I'm, uh, I'm very familiar with uh, featured in films. And uh, this is, it's just a really, it shows so much about the 
changes that are happening in the Bay Area, the effects of gentrification and the tension between long term residents of Oakland and the pride of Oaklanders, as well as the challenges that Oaklanders are experiencing as they deal with gentrification, tech bro culture and all the different things. And I, I loved this movie. It was so it was just so sharp and it's so well done. And I strongly recommend you check that out. Also, a movie that's all about Oakland and is unfortunately based on a very true, very horrible story is Fruitvale Station. I moved to Oakland the about two months after Oscar Grant was murdered by a BART cop. And it was another story of a young man who was just gunned down, absolutely unethically un, for no reason whatsoever and it was caught on tape and at the same time so little happened and it was a brutal story and th- but at the same time this movie is it's one of those movies where you're like it's hard to get up the gumption to watch it but I think it's important to do again particularly for people who are having a hard time understanding the concept around defunding the police uh, this is a movie that kind of helps under- that helps show what it is to live in uh, li- live under the fear of of white cops, really. And unfortunately, the horrible consequences that happen when a white cop decides to take the law into his own hands. Um, Fruit Fail Station was directed by Ryan Coogler, who you might remember from Black Panther. And again, beautiful, necessary film. And finally, another movie that's really not so much about police violence, but it's really more just about uh, black male identity and the black male search for personhood, which is The Last Black Man in San Francisco. I rewatched this movie with my partner just the other night because I basically was like, this is the most beautiful movie I've ever seen, and I need everyone I know to watch it. And uh, it is an incredible film. It's got a great story behind it. And it's just a really, it's just a beautiful movie all said. And it's one of those movies that it gives itself room to breathe. Uh, and room to really just have let everything that's in the frame just shine. And uh, I, I talked about it at length on my Patreon for my Patreon subscribers, all about kind of the idea of what it is for uh, black men not to necessarily look for manhood, uh, which is often the arc that a lot of our heroes get in films as men, like boys becoming men. But um, this was almost more of a uh, of a black person becoming a person. And I don't mean that he didn't have personhood. I mean that in in society that t- seeks to dehumanize, what does it mean to just exist as a person and to exist outside of having to prove yourself worthy? And I think this is such a beautiful movie. Um, I just find myself often holding my breath at some of the frames. It's just so damn pretty. And it was the cinematographer is an Oregon native, and I'm very happy about that. So that makes me feel a little bit of hometown pride. So The Last Black Man in San Francisco, that's on Amazon Prime. And there are a huge number of films that are out there that I recommend checking out just to kind of, again, help you grapple if you're having a hard time just understanding these the movements to abolish the cops or defund the cops, which are two different things. And again, if you're curious about that, please do Google. Information is out there. Um, but I think it's just important for us to continue to listen, continue to pay attention, to continue to uplift African-American creators. And that means you know, renting their films and it means buying their albums and it means just giving financial support to black artists to let them know that their work is vital and their work is necessary. And again, just the the material support um, that we rely on each other for as artists in in this crazy world. So please do check those things out. Um, If you're looking for other recommendations, I would recommend taking to social media or you can always reach out to me at Hey Allie Moon and I will let you know things that have touched me. I've been trying to watch new things and engage with new things as much as possible. It is kind of part of my my ethic. Uh, So that's, that's where I'm at. Anyway, so to everyone who's in the streets protesting, thank you. To everyone who's at home donating and speaking out on social media and having very difficult conversations with their relatives and their friends and their high school friends and people they barely know, thank you. To everyone who's fighting the fight in whatever way that they are able to, understanding that this shit is scary and hard and everyone has different capabilities of working and and fighting for the fight in their own ways. But if, if you are doing anything, thank you. For real. I know it feels sometimes like we're, we're doing it wrong or we're, we're not doing enough. I certainly feel that way. Um, and at the same time, I just think that we are at a tipping point culturally, and I'm very excited to see what comes out of this. It has been a long, long time coming, hundreds of years coming, in fact. And we're not 
nearly there yet, but I have hope that we will get through this and we will see something new that uh, can help save more people's lives and keep more people alive that deserve to be alive and to help preserve the memory of people who have been taken for us, even though they 100% deserve to be alive right now. And um, I think that we just have to keep on remembering that this is about preservation of those who uh, who deserve to live and and deserve to live unencumbered by fear of an oppressive state. So that's that. Now, allow me to introduce my interview subjects, Kevin Patterson and Alana Phelan. Uh, you can re- find out all about them at Poly Role Models, and they have a bunch of other links that you'll hear about at the, at the end. In the meantime, they'll have their Amazon links that will, that will drop at the end of the interview as well, as, and they're also in the show notes. So do check out those books. Again, material support of artists. Please do buy the books if they sound interesting to you. And please enjoy my conversation with Kevin Patterson and Alana Phelan. Kevin, thank you so much for joining me. I'm really happy to talk to you both. Hey, thanks for having us. Thank you. Yeah, so obviously Kevin has been on the podcast already, so you are going to be my first second time around. Which really? Is- wow, yeah. I'm actually honored. I was also <laughs> like an, in, an in-home guest for uh, the first appearance. You were, which is always my favorite way of recording, but unfortunately I don't live near a lot of the people that I want to record with, so I kind of in this position of having to do these these distant conversations, but it's nice to be able to have technology connect us, so that's pretty good. It's okay, this time he's at my house. Yeah. Oh, nice. <laughs> well, at least we're, we've got some coziness going on. So yeah, so Alana and Kevin, tell me about um, your project, rela- your artistic relationship, your your personal relation. Like, t- how did you come together to create what you've created? I like that she kind of looks at me like like uh, as an indicator that I should answer first. Absolutely, <laughs> um, I'm not starting this one. So um, I was writing. Um, I, I've, I've got a book called "Love's Not Colorblind: uh, Race and Representation in Polyamorous and Other Alternative Communities," and. Like, that's sort of, like, the important book. That's the book people know me for. And while I was writing that, I, I took a break. I took a break to just sort of, like, get it off my mind because, like, I'm talking about racism and oppression and entitlement and so on, and it's not the easiest topic. So I took a mental break and started writing some superhero shit just because I like superhero shit. And I eventually showed it to Atlanta, and she really wasn't into it. So I just sort of... <laughs> I just sort of put it aside, put out, you know, finished Love's Not Colorblind, um, toured the book all over the place. And then eventually I was like, hey, do you think we could like really look at this again? Because Elena has a skill set. I have a skill. I have a certain skill set. Yeah, a particular set of skills. I, yeah, that's what it particular set. <laughs> you sound like a spy. Neeson. I love it. <laughs> yeah, she's the Liam Neeson of librarians. <laughs> So I actually have a library degree. Um, I do not have a creative writing degree or anything like that, but I spent uh, I spent a lot of time reading and I spend a lot of time following authors. And I had was in the middle of doing some time on an American Library Association book list committee. So I was in the midst of like sort of doing a review of all these books. And I had my little critical eye on and Kev handed me what was essentially like a guy who had never written fiction before's first draft. And I read the, I read the first two pages. I don't even know if I got to the second page. I said, Kev, I can't do this. I can't do this. I'm in the middle of reading. Like, I think it was like 250 books or something that year for the committee. Oh, wow. And I was already in, if it, if it's not working by the first couple pages, if it's not doing what the committee needed it to do, set it aside and I told him, no, absolutely not. I can't, I can't. And his, his feelings were hurt. But the thing is, is despite that, he really uh, took it with grace. You know, he just was like, okay, I'm hurt, but this isn't going to affect our friendship. And then later when he came back to me with the book, because he basically said like, I'm not going to take like my hurt out on you. And I had a little bit more time. We were we were a lot closer to the end of the committee year. I was like, yeah, absolutely. I'll help you with this. And then somehow um, within like two months, I was helping him with some like plot and character stuff. And he was like, yeah, no, no, no. Write that. That was a good idea. Write that. And then he's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to put your name on the cover. 
<laughs> and then all of a sudden I was in this like five book commitment to this <laughs> series and now I'm an author I guess I mean it, it wasn't like essentially a first draft of a, someone who's never written fiction it was absolutely, it was absolutely a first draft <laughs> of someone who had never written fiction yeah yeah and and I have never been one of those people who's like, anyone can write a book because I do believe that, I mean, I, I think that if someone does want to write a book, they can probably do it. But if you want to publish it and you want to go through to traditional publishing and you want it to be successful um, in that particular way, like if you want it to go through all of those steps, it does have to hit certain things and it does have to to be in a certain style and it does have to hit like certain criteria and that's not something that you can just like do off the top of your head even if you're a lifelong reader you might be missing some of those things if you're not if you haven't like learned how to critique or if you haven't been through creative writing classes so Mm -hmm. yeah and like i'm i know how to play with toys that's something i'm very good at it's something i've done my whole life I can play with toys and it can be fun, but it doesn't make a good story. And Elena knows how stories are structured, how they're written. So her her role essentially was to like take my playing with toys and like film it in a way that made it a cinematic movie. <laughs> no, it's really the other way around. I think Kev sees movies in his head and I make them into novels, right? So one of my favorite books when I was a kid was the novelization of the movie Labyrinth. So if anybody, and if anybody had that book, they know that David Bowie's character, Jareth, is actually a, it's actually her, Sarah's mother's boyfriend. Hmm. Um, So Sarah's mother is an actress who left her father, which is why she has her like evil stepmother character. Mm -hmm. And she's off in Hollywood trying to make it big. And she's got this boyfriend who's also an actor. And they're in some newspaper clippings in Sarah's room. But the book makes that very obvious. Whereas Mm -hmm. in the movie, it's sort of like blink and you miss it. So the book adds like a little bit more backstory and a little bit more depth. And it makes it a little bit um, easier to understand like why Sarah is where she is. And also it just makes it a little bit more creepy that she's, that she's cast her mother's boyfriend as the love interest. But for me, it's like, that's what it's like. It's like Kev's writing these movies and I'm helping him turn them into novelizations. Sure. And it makes sense. I mean, for the fact that you're a, you're a book person, like to be able to see the, 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 what's the like the scaffolding beneath a story and i think that's one of those things that i think a lot of people take for granted because we're all you know we all swim in story all the time from the Mm -hmm. moment we're basically born into this culture but that doesn't necessarily mean that you can see the mechanizations that happen in the background um and for some people that actually like i mean i'm i'm weird kind of analogy but i started in my career as a lighting designer for the theater and so for me, going to the theater kind of got ruined um, for a while because I was always paying way more attention to the grid and always paying way more attention to lighting cues than I was to the like letting myself get washed away in the story. And so I think that, you know, for book people, there's this fine line between seeing so much of the the craft that you can't lose yourself in a good story. Um, so how do you feel like you were able to balance that for yourself? I mean, have you written novels in the past, Alana? Uh, no, I, um, I wrote a lot when I was a kid, but it was, um, sort of in, in bursts. Um, so I would like start a lot of stuff and then never finish it. Um, and then I got married and had a kid very young. So I kind of like just focused on raising my kid and going back to school and then got my library degree. Um, so by the time that I met Kev, I was mostly focused on short stories. Mm -hmm. Uh, I hadn't done anything that was novel, like in years and years. Uh, I think maybe I had done like a draft for NaNoWriMo years before I met Kev and just had, I'd lost it in a, in a computer crash Mm. and just never bothered again, really. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so I'm, I was very focused on like short works, anything where I could, could sort of take time out of my busy life and just sit down and get like a draft out, um, within Mm -hmm. a night or two. Uh, so it, it was very different. You know, it's it's been a it's been a learning process absolutely for both of us. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, like you said, like we we're we're so soaked in in stories and fiction and you know, just as part of culture that I never really stopped to take um, a really good look at how these things are structured. And working with Elena gave me a lot of gave me a lot of sort of um, depth to what I was looking at, where just thinking about characters' motivations, thinking about like um, setting scenes, structure, um, universe building, like a lot of that stuff is stuff that I didn't pay as much attention to, or I didn't see quite the nuance in until we started working together. Oh yeah. Like the other, like a day or two ago, you were like, this thing, this thing, if this is this, then these two characters are essentially like the same person, but like two sides of the coin. I'm like, yep, 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 yep. (laughs) And that's, that's, that's the kind of like underneath work that you weren't doing before. Right. Yeah. Like I, like there were things that I would pay a lot of attention to, like, um, like say in the first, in our, in our first book together, operator, there is a really detailed escape from Washington, D.C. <laughs> that I spent a lot of time in Google Maps making sure that that was a very accurate representation mm-hmm. of escaping from Washington, D.C. <laughs> but like, that, but these are things that like I, I, but that's something I paid a lot of attention to, whereas like sort of the relationship between a, a couple of characters, I didn't spend nearly as much attention to. Sure. But I mean, yeah, as, as you go through the process and you, I'm assuming, I mean, this is certainly true for me. Like you start to notice where something is underwritten more because you just, you know, like, Oh, wait a second. Why do these characters get together or what is going on? And once you have a question like that as an author, it's almost like a great neon arrow pointing to, you need to write more about this or you need well, no, to clarify. No, that, was, that was my job in the first book. It was <laughs> my job to be like, uh, my job was like, Oh, that's missing. I guess I, I just have to do that. Okay, cool. I'll just do that. Yeah, mm-hmm. where there were there were there were a few chapters where Elena was like, "Hey, you know, you're missing. You should rewrite this. Hey, you need to spell this out a little bit better." And then there were times where she said, "This scene can be rewritten in a certain way," and I was just like, "You know what? You should just rewrite that scene. It mm-hmm. looks like what you're describing to me is really awesome. It probably looks better in your head than it does in mine. You should just write that chapter." And now put your name on the cover. Yeah. <laughs> That's just where that all came from. That's awesome. So, well, so let's talk a little bit more about the actual books and the actual content of the books. What's the story of For Hire? Um, well, the two books are two, uh, are two different things going on roughly the same time. But Operator, Operator follows uh, a young woman named Sana, who is the best operator in, in the country. and the way our universe is set up, if you are a superhuman and you want to use your powers in a way, you actually have to be like registered to do that. And you can be a superhero, which is basically like a super cop registered with whatever city you're living in. Or you can be an operator, which is an independent freelancer, kind of like if the Punisher took paychecks. <laughs> so Sana is the best operator in the country. And her girlfriend, since since youth is the best superhero in the country. And it kind of becomes a very difficult situation between the two of them because they, they, their respective reputations would be damaged if people knew that they were together. Mm. So they've got a very closed off relationship and it, it, it becomes sort of, it becomes the friction that, that, um, that sets them apart from everybody else. And then all of a sudden, Sana gets a, she gets a contract from her favorite, her favorite uh, client, and it ends up setting them directly at odds. You know, not just, we don't want to be seen in public with each other. Now it's, if we see each other, it's shoot on sight. So that's the first book. So it's very like big and bombastic. The second book is actually um, much more smaller scale and it's com- two completely different characters. It's this uh, young woman named Vanessa and her power is like most, um, they're called variants in our world. In, in, in this world, most variants have a relatively low key power. You know, it's not, nobody has like the, the big Superman powers, right? There are no optic blasts. There are no optic blasts. (laughs) So Vanessa has this power and um, it gets noticed by a, a local superhero who's kind of, I'm not even going to say like B list or C list 
kind maybe of not even D list, maybe like E list. <laughs> and uh, this the superhero who who basically is a cop is like, hey, so I really want to um, boost what I do, and I think what you do and what I do could come together in a way, except that way is not quite legal. <laughs> <laughs> And so you have these two people who end up entangling their lives in in ways that are uh, dangerous and dangerous, <laughs> illegal, unethical. Um, all sorts of things are going on in this book, yeah. but it's it's on so much uh, more of a smaller scale, and it's a lot more. I don't want to say it's more personal of a story because they're actually both very personal stories, but the you know the fate of the world is not at stake. It's really more of the fate of a person's destiny. Yeah, which is sort of what I like about the way the two the two stories interplay, because like Operator takes place across the across the nation. A lot of things are happening. A lot of moving parts. Um, like Lana said, it's like the fate of the nation is at stake. Whereas Audition, some of the same characters appear. They're happening roughly at the same time. You know, some of the like some of the actions from Operator appear in Audition, but really, it's just a smaller scale story. Like if if everybody dies in in Audition, then like nobody, you know, nobody blinks. It's fine. Meanwhile, if everybody dies in Operator, you know, the the, the nation goes into mourning. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. and everything changes. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. So, are you working on a third now? We are. And a fourth. And a fourth. <laughs> and we've got a vague outline for a fifth. Um, oh, wow. Well, so basically, when Kev brought me that first draft for, for Operator, um, he ended up, what it was, was a lot of backstory. <laughs> and when I told him it was a lot of backstory, when I pointed that out to him, that the plot didn't start until chapter, what was it, 12? 11. 11. <laughs> um, <laughs> He was like, do I have to delete it? And I was like, no, 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 buddy. No, we're going to just like, we're going to cut it and we're going to put it in its own file. And then we're going to turn it into a prequel and it's going to be great. <laughs> um, so actually we're working on that prequel right now. It looks like uh, we're going to be wrapping it up around uh, end, end of May, right? Is is That's our goal for ourselves is to get it done end of May. Let's just say by the summer. Yeah, by the summer. Um so it's actually, it's, it's coming along really fast uh, because, well, it was backstory. We had to add a plot to it, but, um, but we love the characters and we already know them because it's our, it's mm-hmm. just, it's just Sana and uh, Marcella back in high school. It's when they met, it's how they got together and it's, it's how they become superheroes. It's really the story that leads them and pushes them to be the, the, the heroes that they become. So. And like the the writing process has been very very interesting along all three books. Oh God, where, um, <laughs> so different. Where where operator, we had a beginning, a middle, and end, and like we had to make it clearer, we had to make it better, we had to fluff it out, and like uh, and but you could have read the first draft of operator, and it doesn't it doesn't differ dramatically from what we ended up publishing. But also we ended up having, like, um, since so much of the backstory was in the first 10 chapters that we got rid of, we had to find a way to make these characters more real in the second half than they would have otherwise. Mm -hmm. Then um, with Audition, we started from scratch. Brand new characters. No, you know, we we weren't working from a a pre-written first draft. No, Kev just had, like, a spark of an idea based on... Beyonce. <laughs> yeah, I had a yeah. I worked for a Beyonce concert, and because Beyonce is Beyonce, I had mm. all the wonderful ideas, and we get got into writing a second book. And writing a second book, writing from scratch with another person was it was a struggle. Boy, was it. We fought. Oh, we were at the point where we were fighting not every day, but it, over but, every detail. Over every detail, like getting angry at each other and trying to figure out. I at one point I said. <laughs> I said to Kev, I was like, I am putting more energy and fighting more with you than I do with any of my partners. This is ridiculous. <laughs> I'm like, but you're worth it. This is worth it. Yeah, creative well, relationships are relationships. We have yeah. to remember that. <laughs> well, she's my work wife. Uh, as much as she hates when I say I that. I hate when he says that. <laughs> I hate it so much. But then at the same time, like we're we're working on the third book, Supercell, and like 
we have to add a plot where there yeah. was no plot. Yeah. And then also we have to make sure that we're keeping our characters true to what we have we already published in Operator. Yeah, but they have to be like less formed versions of those people. Exactly. They have to be like but but they have to get where they're going and we have to set that up. There's a lot going on, but like at on the other hand, it feels like home, right? Like it feels like a break <laughs> from from the work of audition. Yeah, audition but we're still so doing a lot of creation creation on a lot of creative work together. So it's been a very good, happy balance. And much less arguing. So much less arguing. <laughs> so much. Well, kind of as a weird segue. So you're both polyamorous, but you're not partners in real nope, life. No. Nope, okay. nope, nope. Sorry. Been, sorry. Wow. <laughs> I did it again. Wow. I do this every time. Yeah. That, that was the least harsh way I've done it, though. Yeah, yeah. There you, you go. Usually when, when someone asks if, we, if we've ever been partners, it's ew. It's ew. I didn't think <laughs> ew. I'm, I'm getting better. Boom. <laughs> but we've, um, we've been metamors for four separate times. <laughs> yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I think that's one of the things that's really funny is like when people who aren't polyamorous or even people who are see like poly relationships that aren't necessarily partner based, they don't, they, a lot of times people will assume that if you're in connection with each other, you must be sleeping together or you must be like a lot of people thought that my girlfriend and my primary partner were lovers too, just because they had saw pictures on Instagram of the three of us hanging out. And I'm like, right. so this is a fun lesson in polyamory. Not yeah. everybody is sleeping together. Sometimes right. you all just love each other as family or as community. But yeah. yeah. Oh, it's yeah. Just, no. It's our our friendship began as a community yeah. connection. We met at a discussion group. I actually was not even living in the area at the time, but I had sort of like um, helped put together like an offshoot of an existing group, like um like where the location was, the new location of the discussion group was. And then I ended up um, having to move away out of state. But every time I was back in the area to visit, um, I would go check in and I would go, if the group was meeting, I would meet. And then here's this, this person I'd never met before, Kevin. And he's like coming in with all these like great ideas and all this, um, all this history with his relationship and, and there was a lot of uh, erratic arm movements and loud voices. And then that's who I am as a person. But it wasn't just that I was like, wait a second, here's this guy coming in with this, like, uh, well, these nerd t-shirts and, <laughs> and um, the fantastic four movie was about to come out. And I'm like, Hey, a bunch of us are going, do you want to go? And I think it actually only ended up being like m- me and you and my partner and your wife and and like maybe one other person and we all walked out of that movie theater sad. It was a it was, it was not a bad a movie. movie. <laughs> yeah, I but think you were probably in the majority bond. with that. <laughs> yeah. It was a good way to bond. Yeah, yeah. Our sadness bonded us forever. <laughs> but but then we, you know, since since we did have that concept of like sort of community was important and and making sure that um that having a community where everybody could speak was important. We ended up like hanging out more and talking about stuff more and meeting more and arguing with people more. Yeah. And, you know, just arguing comic book stuff and just geek stuff in general. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you you form, you form friendships and sometimes that means dating the same person. I was going to say, and then you meet their partners and then you're like, Ooh, (laughs) Maybe I should also ask that person out. And then all of a sudden you're metamors. Yep. And then you're hanging out more. Yeah. And you're writing books together. We're We're the the (laughs) metamost. That feels rehearsed, but I like it. It's not. It's not. We actually, um, when that first relationship broke up, I was like terrified that that our friendship was going to suffer because Mm -hmm. I felt like our friendship had really solidified through that metamorship. And so we actually came up with our own phrase, <laughs> which is whatever more. Um, and I, I have a t-shirt or a tank top now that says world's greatest, whatever more. If it, nice. if, if it had been up to that, uh, that shared partner, our friendship probably would have broken up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I hate Good that when that happens. Um, so is there polyamory content in the books? Yes. Um, Especially in especially in the first book, Operator, and like Audition teases it and Supercell spells it out. But uh, Operator 
Operator definitely has um, a polyamorous a polyamorous angle to it. And something I'm really proud of is that we subvert the love triangle. Yes. The uh, the love V. Because they're, they're stupid. And with, <laughs> when, you're, when you're polyamorous for long enough, they stop making any sense at all. Like you're, I I'm, hate you're, po- love triangles so much. Yeah. They're just such a crutch. And they're so bad, so badly deployed in pretty much all me- media involving romance. It, it drives me batty. They're badly deployed. They're badly resolved. It's always something like someone becomes evil, or or, or, or your sister, or their sister, <laughs> or somebody dies, or there's always. It's never like somebody's forced to make a choice. It's always the choice is made by by the circumstances. Whereas, well, when they do make a choice, the person that they don't choose just kind of disappears, right? Like yeah. it's kind of a pl- the plot of the Baxter movie, if you remember that from I guess the early aughts, where it's just like we see these rom coms where there's a love triangle and then. When they make the choice, we don't see what happens to the person they dump, right? The otherwise wonderful person that they were in love with. And I find oh. that to be a real shitty lesson. No, yeah. So we um so I do a movie night at my house every month or two, and we just watch Kissing Jessica Stein. And that mm-hmm. movie has like an open-ish relationship at the beginning where Helen is dating three men. And, like, one of them is blatantly angry about it, but he's, like, cheating on his wife. But the other two, like, seem to all know about each other, and they're kind of fine with it. Mm -hmm. Except that when she starts dating Jessica, like, we never hear from any of those men again. Right, right. Exactly. Yes. (laughs) Yeah, so they just disappear. Yeah, they become non-entities. It's like these characters we've invested time and energy into suddenly disappear. Yeah. yeah, and that's the thing. Like, I think it's just as a writer and as a polyamorous person, there's so much opportunity for drama and story and character development within ethical non-monogamy, and yet somehow we just don't get those stories nearly enough. And instead, it creates this like otherwise good people becoming assholes, or you know, yep. people making terrible choices because it's some sort of unwritten story dictate says they have to choose one. Monogamy oh, is required. Time. Of the Prince southern eye, of the, the southern. southern of, I mean, and <laughs> meanwhile, with uh, with with operators, something I'm really proud about is that we we have something that vaguely resembles a love triangle. We do, but uh, well, one, it's actually a triangle and not a V. Yes, mm-hmm. and two, the the conflict isn't the existence of the love triangle. Mm-hmm. The conflict mm-hmm. is that, like, I mean, just using the names of our respective products. If I know you as Artgasm and I know Atlanta as Polyamorous Librarian, but she knows you as Allie and you know me as Kevin, you know, maybe we are hiding different aspects of our lives from one another. Mm-hmm. And that's the conflict, but not mm-hmm. the fact that we're all into each other. Right. And that's the thing, like, and that's a th- there's so many opportunities in polyamory. It's like, you know, people always say like, well, polyamory is cheating. And we're like, no, actually you can cheat in polyamory, but polyamory is not cheating. And people think, well, then how is that possible? And you say, well, cheating is just breaking a boundary, breaking a rule. Yep. So mm-hmm. it doesn't matter if it's, the, if the, it's a rule about sexual fidelity or not. It, just the fact is you can hurt people. You can lie to people even in ethical polyamorous relationships. Yep. Yes. And that's oh, yeah. Well, so our um, our second book, Audition, the, one of the main characters, Camille, um, we wanted to be clear in our books that there are different kinds of long-term non-monogamous relationships. And Camille, a huge part of what she's going through is the breakup of her triad. And mm. it's, her, you know, she's mourning it in a totally different way than her partner is mourning it. And also one of the things we wanted to do with that is to make sure that it wasn't like two two women and a man. It's Mm -hmm. her and her two husbands. Mm -hmm. Um, So one of her husbands leaves that relationship and you get to see um, each person's perspective, at least a little bit during throughout the course of the book. Yeah. And the conflict isn't the fact that she has two husbands. The The conflict is based on who these people are and how they relate to one another, almost like in real life. Yeah. Go figure. Mm -hmm. (laughs) right so can i ask uh, kevin obviously as an educator do you find that you're having i mean your career is similar to mine in that like you write educational stuff and then you also write fiction and narrative stuff do you find that you're having you know fans of your sex ed or your relationship education follow you to these novels or or do you feel like they're pretty separate uh audiences i mean thankfully the people who, uh, who who read Love's Not Colorblind, like uh, a lot of them follow over to um, to to the For Hire series. Like it's not something I'm expecting because like 
they're two different. They're obviously they're two. They're going in two different directions. They're doing two different things. But people who are reading a book about race and representation in polyamorous communities, they also want to read a book about queer polyamorous uh, POC centered superheroes. You know, mm-hmm. so like. I'm trying to be the representation while also talking about the lack of representation. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. Yeah, if, do you feel like it might happen in the inverse too? Do you think you're going to have people who read the novels find your education work? Absolutely not, but I'd Absolutely. love it. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, part of that is just the way that the publishing industry works. So Kev's um, nonfiction work goes through a small press and our books right now are self-published. And so if Kev wanted to, and, you know, talks on, on this and someone like a librarian hears about it, there's a good chance that they could just um, open up a computer and order the book. um, Mm -hmm. Love's not colorblind. But if that librarian wants to order a copy of operator and audition, there are certain blocks that come up Um, that might keep them from doing so. For example, a lot of libraries will only work with certain distributors um, like Baker and Taylor Mm. who do not work with self-publishers at all. So Mm. this creates a lot of barriers for self-publishing authors to get their works into libraries without the help of their fans. And, you know, if you are having difficulty or if you have like a niche market like polyamory, um, it becomes incredibly difficult to get the word out. Yeah, I mean, I find that to be something very true with my own work as well. I mean, I, I definitely have had luck in some ways, like where I can sell my self-published backlist just because Girl Sex 101 became notable enough, even though it is self-published as well, because it kind of gave me a name, people then started reading my backlist, even though my backlist has very little to do with sex education. Um, I think it just becomes like you find those super fans who just like you, like they like me for who I am and they want to read everything I've ever written. Um, and that as, as a self-published author becomes really useful. Those people become the people who, you know, listen to my podcast and then donate to the Patreon and then read all my other books. And those people are, are precious to the independent artists like myself. Um, and oftentimes I, I was surprised to see that people gave a shit about, you know, the, the werewolf books and then continued on to read my memoir and then my, you know, uh, my sex ed book. But, you know, those people are, are awesome. <laughs> and I love them. So. Right. Yeah. It, it, it just becomes so difficult to, to figure it all out because first off, you have a lot of people who don't have any experience, um, who want to get their work out. And then second off, it, it becomes this like constant scramble of always having to put yourself out there and how much, um, you know, self-promotion is too much self-promotion. Are you coming off as being like greedy or grabby or grasping? Um, yep. You know, for me, for as someone who uh, doesn't really lean into the sex part of sex education, mm-hmm. um, I often wonder, it's like, well, you know, I see a lot of people who are in sex education and they're like often, you know, posting like really sexy pictures of themselves. And I'm like, okay, well, that's not me, um, mm-hmm. which is, you know, I have you know, that's, that's, it's just not me. So like, I'm like, oh, well, is that, is that a part of this that I'm going to miss out on? And, you know, I have no pictures to put up, you know, like, I don't, I don't take a lot of pictures of myself at all, let alone like sexy ones that are going to attract, attract attention and, and get that kind of thing. But it's like, it's like, I don't feel like a product. How do I market myself if I don't feel like a product? And then it's, oh, you have to constantly be doing this. You constantly have to be doing that. And it's exhausting, um, especially if you have anything else going on. Like in my case, um, I have this really weird illness that uh, after three years still doesn't have a real diagnosis. And Mm -hmm. I have to live with that thing every day. And I have to balance out like I can only spend limited time on a computer because of it. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. So, you know, how much time am I going to spend in front of a screen today and how much time am I going to spend in self-promotion, right? Yeah. So, like, the whole thing is just so bizarre <laughs> and it's 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 just a constant uh, push and pull of, like, what can I do to make money today and how much have I done to make money today and how good do I feel about what I've done to make money today? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's this weird – I definitely feel the same way. Like, I, I don't – social media has been such a a difficult thing for me just mentally over the past couple of years. And 
you know, it's, it's a weird thing when, when we are brands, when, when, you know, Kevin Patterson is a brand and when Alana is a brand and Alison Moon is a brand and it's not the, the products that we sell, it's not the books that we write or the art that we make, it's the people that we are that yeah. ends up moving product. And so we're, I mean, this, this weird like insidiousness of capitalism where it's like it, you become the thing that you're selling. Mm. And that's really weird. Like I actually found that uh, complicated to make it a little bit personal. So like, obviously I'm polyamorous too, but my partner and I just got legally married. Um, yeah, and so like, I wanted to, thank you. <laughs> I, I wanted to post it online, just like a pictures on Instagram. And it became this thing where it's like, you know, hashtag relationship goals. And like, I, I like that people can look at myself and my partner as inspirational non-monogamous couple but there is this weird feeling i feel when it becomes like this ideal for people to have to emulate in order for them to have you know the ideal polyamorous relationship and it's right. like this is not necessarily something that you know like and I, I just don't it makes me feel like even intimate aspects of myself that i'm sharing with my friends and followers become another opportunity for commodification. Right. Um, yeah. Well, do you remember? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, please. Go ahead. No, do you remember when, um, I, I don't know how long you've been doing polyamory, but do you remember when our little quad broke up? No. Okay. So there was, there were these um, two couples who came together in a quad and they had uh, a lot of good resources. They were very active in the, like the biggest polyamory yahoo group of the late 90s early 2000s um they they had blogs they were very popular and their quad broke up and everyone got really mad that they wouldn't discuss why oh interesting. so it was like they no yeah. longer had ownership of their own relationship because they had spent so much time discussing it people wanted to know what did you do wrong so i can avoid it too Mm -hmm. But here were these people who were actual people who were hurting, right? And this didn't have anything to do with this is like pre-brands, right? They made nothing off of this. Mm -hmm. And that's interesting, though, because I feel like on some levels, like it, it does feel like, well, if, if you are, if you already commodified your, your love and the success of your relationship, it makes perfect sense for you to also commodify the, the, the solution of it. Because if, if everything that you do in your relationship is an educational tool for other people, mm -hmm. then so should the breakup be, right? <laughs> right. And then of course you have exes who are like, don't you ever mention me ever. Yeah. Right. And meanwhile, you're like, I'm learning things. I also want people to learn things. Like if I've learned something and I spend all of my time saying, well, if I've learned something, what's the point if I, if other people can't learn from that? Mm -hmm. Like that, that's a big thing for me is like, Hey, if I make a mistake, like I want to tell other people that I made this mistake. I want to own that mistake, and I want, I want other people to not make it too. You ever want? Mm. You ever play fantasy football? No, no, I no, mean, Kevin. No. I, <laughs> um, I, 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 I got really into fantasy football for a while, and like the 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 basics, the basics of it. If you're unfamiliar with fantasy football, is that you you create a team based on real NFL football players. And as they create real NFL football stats, they accrue a certain number of fantasy points. So if I've got a team and Atlanta's got a team, you know, each week we see who has the more fantasy points, I win or she wins. Mm -hmm. So it became a really difficult thing for me because I'm playing fantasy football, but now like, I kind of want my Giants, I'm a New York Giants fan, I kind of want them to not do as well because I'm playing against somebody who has, like, the Giants defense on their fantasy team. Where, sure, yeah. You know, like, I want Eli Manning to throw four interceptions but also somehow win the game because I want them to win because I'm a Giants fan, but I want him to have a bad game personally because he plays for the other fantasy team. And mm -hmm. I think about that in terms of, like my relationships, where I talk about my fuck ups so much. I talk about things that I do wrong. I talk about things that have been done wrong to me. I talk about how much I learned in the process. And it becomes a difficult thing where like I'll be having an argument with a partner. And thankfully, I don't have a lot of arguments. That's just not how my relationships roll. But I'll be having an argument and I'm like, well, does this mean my polyamory is broken and I'm unfit to talk about the things that I talk about? Or is this going to be another thing that I'm able to tell in a story that I that I share on a podcast or that I go on tour um, for one book or another or go to conferences and speak about this thing that's happening right now? It takes me out of the moment of my own relationship sometimes. And that's a really difficult thing to, to sort of deal with. 
Like, oh yeah. You yeah, know, I like, actually had a, like, a meta thing uh, recently where I, I was dating somebody and we had kind of a, I don't know, like I said, this sounds like really hyper hyperbolic, but kind of a traumatic sexual experience. And um, it basically, I it made me feel imme- like immediately after the experience, I was having a hard time just like just healing on my own because I was thinking immediately about like, oh no, this undermines my authority as a sex educator. If I didn't do the work that I needed to do to be able to process this experience well, I, people won't trust me to educate them. And I'm like, wow, that's a fucked up way of approaching one's own relationship with oneself. That yeah. immediately it became like, oh no, like because I failed, because I fucked up, I am no longer, um, I'm no longer an authority which is not real. And I, I could yeah. certainly counsel any of my colleagues that that's just your own, you know, insecurities coming out. But it certainly made me feel like this wasn't like, you know, 10 years ago, I'm talking about something that happened. I'm talking about something that happened last year. And I've been doing this sex education and non-monogamy education for 10 years at this point. So like, who who am I to think that I should be able to teach when um, I haven't, you know, healed myself sufficiently to, to avoid these kinds of situations? But okay. it's just a, it's a strange kind of way that we kind of put yokes on ourselves around our own creativity and our own ability to connect with people because we think we have to be infallible in order to be able to talk about the stuff and we think that you know polyamory we ha- it has to be a perfect fit all the time for it to be worth pursuing um which yeah. is not you know how it works <laughs> i I've, I've done a lot of learning over like the last two years like i got i got burnt up emotionally pretty pretty harshly uh, a couple of years ago. And in the last two years, like I've done a lot of healing. I've done a lot of um, learning about like self-awareness and like the way we communicate to one another and what we're trying to communicate to one another. And I don't want to talk about any of it because it's all tied to such painful memories. Mm-hmm. And some of it I feel like is not really my story to tell. And that's like, like that's not how human beings are supposed to function. But <laughs> But we've taken on we've taken on these roles, we've taken on these brands that that mean that we have to be like image conscious, which is like the last thing I, I want to be. Right. Yeah, especially with relationships, because it's so hard to like be clean and perfect in when matters of the heart are in, involved. And it's not just that we're we're not doing relationships where there are four thousand books out there telling us how to do them properly. We're literally the people who are writing the books on how to maybe (laughs) possibly do them properly, um, but possibly not. So like Kev and I got a grant to work on um, to take our our workshop based on a a thing that Kevin has on his poly role models blog and turn that into a book. So it goes from (laughs) blog feature to To workshop workshop. to book, um, Mm -hmm. which is called Cautionary Poly. And it takes people's stories and finds like what we call teachable moments, right? And it's just like, okay, what can we learn from this? Because otherwise, we don't have a roadmap. That was Kev's mm-hmm. phrase. We don't have a roadmap. I don't remember ever saying that. You wrote that. <laughs> you put it in a uh, slide. Did I? That You typed that into the slide. Wow. That sounds fake. But anyway, I would uh, never say roadmap either. So I don't know how this happened, but it's right there. But yeah, like that was that was the point in the blog. Like not just tell don't just tell us your horror stories. Tell us what you learned from them. Tell them what what you're not doing going forward or what you're not letting get done to you going forward. And what's kind of interesting is that like communication is the answer for every one of the stories. Uh, that we've why like, like, so like, much communication if you talk more if you be more honest your your horror stories may mostly go away like 97 percent of your horror stories go away if you talk more hmm. yeah it's funny i'm writing a book right now on casual sex and it's like i, I feel like i'm i already know what some people are going to be annoyed with me at is that like 80 percent of the book is like talk before sex more talk during sex more talk after sex more like that's it but how you, is like, that casual <laughs> <laughs> I know, exactly exactly yeah hey, you uh, just want to learn more about pickup artistry and shit i'm just like nah folks like you just have to learn to talk about your feelings sorry that's the advice i've had casual <laughs> sex 250 pages before. telling you how to what? do that what? yeah I've, 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 I've at least once possibly twice had casual <laughs> sex so if you would if you if you need some quotes for that book i got you <laughs> 
Yeah, I know, man. Well, okay. So let's talk a little bit more about the the future of um, of this series, and then um, and yeah, and you. So you already mentioned that you have a nonfiction book that's in the works. So it seems like this this collaboration relationship is going well. I mean, yes. <laughs> like we're stuck. We're, we're we did this to ourselves. We, we did this to ourselves. <laughs> we're we have created quality content, like. We've created a couple of books so far that I think are fucking awesome. Um, we're in the process of working on at least four books right this moment. Yeah. I think by the time they're done, they're going to be fucking awesome. Um, and so with the exception of getting paid for these things, <laughs> I, think our, I think our working relationship has been fantastic and created some, some, some really valuable resources for our polyamorous communities. Yeah, I'm curious actually if you don't mind talking about this. Like, do you, have you kind of created like some sort of you know artistic prenup? Like, what happens if you decide one of you wants to stop writing these books? Like, oh, do you God. know what happens? No. So you what what is that thing? Sunk cost fallacy. <laughs> it's like that relationship thing where you've been with someone for so long that you cannot be with them anymore. So we, no. So we did win a grant. So we are. Uh, we are sort of contractually obligated yeah. to write uh, these two books together. And honestly, the next um, the next two for hire books are a huge chunk of them is already done. Yeah. Um, because the fourth book is a, a collection of like extras, bonus stories, short stories, fun stuff, and some um, collaborations with other, with other artists and writers. Um, and after the next two years, I guess we could reassess if we feel yeah. burned out, but like right now we're in, we're, we're good. I think if we were right, if, if the, if the four books that we're working on, if they were going about as hard as audition was on us, we would die. Yeah, I feel like, we, I feel like we would, it would be a murder suicide. <laughs> Who would start it would be the I, key yeah, question. Yeah, like I don't know who would be who would do the murder or who would do the suicide, but like <laughs> but, but we would not survive it. But like the books we're working on right now, like I'm really happy working on Supercell. It's it's going great. When when um when I get stuck on Supercell, I switch over and work on classifieds. Um I'm already taking in stories for our two nonfiction books. Yeah. And I think it's uh I think it's gonna be going yeah. pretty smoothly and when i need a, a screen break from uh doing work on supercell i am getting together the audiobooks for operator and for audition so oh, cool. there there's so much, there's so much going on and we have given ourselves a lot of um space to not always have our head directly in one project mm-hmm. um so the burnout thing is not even half as bad as it should be but like in relationship terms you got your like operator nre right and then you've got your shaky <laughs> audition uh, like actually getting to know you know the real person and now mm-hmm. we're in that like second honeymoon yeah phase. we're in the established relationship energy of, yeah. of super cell yep ere time <laughs> So it's the seven book itches that you what you have to really worry about, right? Yeah, Where, exactly. Yeah, seven is when things start to fall apart. Also, at the same time, which oh god, I shouldn't even like talk about it because no, I'm just gonna make myself it. nervous. I actually was a finalist um, in in uh, Harlequin's mentorship program. I I submitted a first chapter to them and they were like, please submit the rest of the book. And I was like, Oh my God, that was in the midst of a bunch of stuff. And I didn't write more than a chapter. So now I have to finish that too. Um, So that I love that. Like, so they, so actually for those who don't know, um, Harlequin created a queer and poly friendly um, uh, small press imprint. Right. So that's their new thing. So so I'm I'm gonna sit here and wait and see how their polyamory plays out, right? I'm I'm expecting a lot of triads or thruples or whatever. Oh god. I know, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to use that word. Um <laughs> I know some people really enjoy that word, but I'm too old. Oh uh, no, I hate the word thruple. It's like a it grates my ears. So yeah, I totally understand. Um, <laughs> Apologies to those who listen who use the word, but yeah, I'm a yeah, triad. I, I usually love when people squish words together, but I think it's because it's overwriting a word that has been in the community for so long 
Um, Mm -hmm. I've been doing this for over 20 years. And so triad has always been my go-to word. Um, Mm -hmm. Also, it's, it's got that like, you know, I don't know. It just has it just has that power to it, right? Yeah, because yeah. you don't know if we're talking about a three person relationship or a Chinese gangster. <laughs> I was gonna say like some sort of like power source thing, oh, yeah, like a tri- like a tri- tri- or something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was gonna go for like a Triforce joke, but whatever. Yes, um, also also a legitimate video game joke. <laughs> yes. Um, but yeah, so so I'm I'm sort of holding out to see where Harlequin is going with that. But I'm also writing in the meantime um, a a book about what it's like to be sort of bisexual and figuring it out, mm-hmm. and how even today when you have access to so much information, you still kind of have to uh, feel your way in relationships and mm-hmm. get out of your own way uh, when you are a like a, especially like a suburban bisexual mm-hmm. who doesn't have access to like a lot of uh, queer community. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's my little love story that I'm writing right now. And nice. although Alana hasn't asked and won't ask and doesn't want, I'm going to send her some notes on how to, <laughs> on how to add some superheroes to that. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. You can never have too many superheroes. My my super adorable, realistic, <laughs> bisexual suburban superheroes. Maybe like a firefighter relationship. A true one, all All right. So, <laughs> where can people find more about you and about your work and uh, purchase your books and support all the things? Um, I'm Polly Role Models on all the things: Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, uh, Twitter, especially on Patreon. I'm Polly Role Models on Patreon. Um, our books together are uh, for hire mag on Twitter, but you'll find more on Facebook. So if you go to like facebook.com slash for hire mag, cause everything's set out like a magazine, um, you'll find all the latest information on the for hire series and also our effing foundation, uh, nonfiction books. And for me, it's the polyamorous librarian pretty much everywhere except Tumblr because Tumblr is for my kid. Like that, we keep our social media very separate. Uh, and then, uh, except Twitter, where I am at Hello Librarian. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me. I really appreciate it. And yeah, go, go check out those those awesome superhero books, y'all. Yeah. All yeah. right. Thank Have you so much. Thank you. All right. All right. Bye. And that's it for this week's episode of the Orgasm Podcast. Again, as always, feel free to find me on social media. If you have questions, if you have things you'd like to share, I'm on Twitter at HeyAllyMoon. You can email me at artgasmcast at gmail.com. If you like what I'm doing and you would like to support me, please, please go to Patreon. It's patreon.com slash artgasm. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash artgasm. While I was on my hiatus, I did lose a number of Patreon supporters, which I totally understand and I have no ill will towards. But if you would like to kind of jump back on board and listen to the backlog of a lot of different uh, solo episodes I do, if you want to hear me talk about that beautiful film, The Last Black Man in San Francisco, you can do so over on my Patreon. I will be back again in two weeks with another episode, another full interview. And in the meantime, thank you so much. Please take care of yourself and your friends and family and communities and Black Lives Matter. Take care. Bye.